So, uh, so we will have more Ori Pekelman, and it's a, you will see it's a, it's a sweet moment. Uh, so Ori is kind of the French API evangelist or the French hypermedia evangelist. So he has he made some talks at the Paris API meetup. He is the IT consultant, and he is also the founder of the Paris Data Geek meetup. So he will make for uh, he will make a, a small presentation uh, first. Uh, waiting for the people because a lot of people wants to see the the, the other one, so he will make Don't some. Go away, Steve. Yeah. So uh, and then he will make uh, the presentation he he had to make. Uh, so we have Ori Pickleman for 35 minutes, and you will see that is 35 sweet minutes, and and dynamic ones. So thank you. Please a big applause for Ori Pickleman. So Steve is leaving, but. Um, uh, uh, so before, I, I think these guys are going to do a, a demonstration later, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to, to uh, steal any of their thunder, but sometimes uh, uh, the questions that people ask me about that is whether there are any people really doing this. I mean, uh, so are there anything, uh, any stuff in production, and uh, what is the value of that? So th that's an example. So it's novitia.eu, it's a transport data uh, API. And uh, I haven't, uh, so I, I just discovered uh, um, this version. And the thing is that kind of they change their API. Uh, I see, I, I've seen V0, but I haven't seen what they've been doing for the past several months. And the, and the person told me, okay, I, I'll send you the URL for the new API. And that's kind of, oh, that, and uh, as a matter of fact, it wasn't needed because I, I just went to api.navitia.io and I got this nice document with links in it and that uh, says that there is an API v0 that is deprecated and there's a new one called v1 and I click on that one and I, I, I've never really seen the documentation of this thing right? and so what does this one do? It has Okay, it has something called coverage. So coverage was, is it, it, these are regions, it's Paris, New York, San Francisco, and Nantes. And I have templated URLs like you've seen in uh, Steve's talk. And mm, okay, so there are regions and uh, stop points and networks. I'll go there, up. I get a nice error message and ta, 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 ta. Hmm, okay, this kind of works. I know how to use this API. No API docs, right? And you know how to use this API, right? And so if I, so I have transferred information, now I know what are the networks. From the networks, I can go inside the network and know what are the lines of the metro and everything else. I haven't read a single bit of documentation, and this works. So uh, uh, Steve uh, uh, talked a lot about the fact that uh, this is for tooling, for, for, you know, for the automagic binding. I, I, I tend to disagree. I think that the automagic binding uh, is soapy and will break. And the more tooling we'll have, the more breakage we're going to have. Uh, but that uh, conventions are good. So uh, uh, some of the stuff we might be able to automate, which is nice. Some is really domain specific and the collection item uh, pattern is very useful, but kind of rare at the end. Um, uh, so I don't know how, how useful this is in, you know, for the automated stuff. It's damn useful for a developer that wants to write a client for this one, because if I have a single use case to implement, well, I'm almost basically there. I mean, I've clicked three times. Uh, I know I have all the information I need uh, in order to uh, uh, to use this API. So, um, well, that was that, and I'll go to my presentation now. Okay, I think it's here. Okay. Um, I think I should do something like that. I'm okay. So. Uh, Okay, this is too much sound. This is much too much sound. So I, I'm Ori Peckelman. I have a consulting company called Con Constellation Metrics. And I'm going to talk about hypermedia, but most of what I'm going to talk about is REST. And I imply that hypermedia should simply be a very reasonable default 
as you've seen, why not give the URL? Why would you obfuscate the fact that you've deprecated a part of your API? Why not give the entry point? And this is, well, much too much. So, so I'm just going to trying to, to get from you know the past year or so, I, I've been really doing a lot of these API projects. I've been doing this probably for, for something like 20 years now. Go away, music. Um, um, but, um, well, you have all seen that this is a very, you know, very hot subject these days. And I'm, this is not going to be in a kind of a, a structured dissertation where I'm going to talk about the basics of hypermedia. You've already had that right by, by Steve. Um, uh, I'm going to talk, uh, just give kind of anecdotal things I've seen, patterns that I find to be useful or anyway, stuff that you might want to think about when designing your APIs. Some of it is just kind of tricks. So uh, when we talk about REST, right, we, we're talking about an architectural style, which is basically the same thing as saying uh, a design pattern. So it is, it's an architecture level design pattern, which specifically deals with connecting to uh, heterogeneous systems. It's basically that. And it's a, a kind of, a, 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 and it's important to know, you know where this uh, is born from. This comes from a post hoc analysis of why the web is a good thing. So um, Roy Fielding, uh, Saint Fielding, uh, worked with, you know, with Tim Berners-Lee in the, the, the early days of the web. And th these are not the specs of the web, right? This is, I mean, the red thing is, is not how we built the web, it's how we understood uh, how cool the thing we built is. So when they looked back at, at, at the web, at the HTTP 1.1 1 .1 web dev stuff, they said, oh, Gosh, this really, really works nicely. And, uh, uh, and this has effects beyond whatever we plan for. And if we, we, we use it now for other stuff, we will get the same kind of value, same kind of, of efficiencies um, uh, we get from the web. We are going to pay some pri prices. And part of the price is going to be the fact that we are going to use a universal interface which basically means we get less magic. We don't get the uh, auto magic -y binding thingy. We are not going forcefully to be able to generate our client code, but the universal, the universal stuff is going to help us with its ubiquity, uh, with the simplicity, the reuse, and uh, uh, defining what a standard is, is, is something really, really hard because there's, you know, standard can be something that a, a, a standards body has decided is a standard. But when we, when we think about a standard, we also think about something simple. If it's standard, then it just kind of works, while if it's not standard, we'll have to do something really, really hard to do so. So one of the ways for me to kind of measure how standard something is, how simple it is, is what would be the level of client-side dependencies I need in order to interact with it. And we've seen, you know, with, you know, the, the nice JSON uh, API, API uh, you've seen before, is that, you know, a browser works and, you know, kind of you click and it works. And if you're implementing it really, I mean, the, the client side, it, it, basically you just need to be able to parse text and if possible JSON and it works. So this is really, uh, and if you think, uh, uh, if you want to interact with the WSSE stack, what is the, the, the enormous amount of si client-side libraries, the hundreds of megabytes of code, in order to be able to do the very, very complicated stuff they do. So again, let's go to some anecdotes. And we'll start with the double whammy. So these are just names I invent like that to be charming. And uh, in previous talks, uh, I, I, I insisted uh, on the fact that uh, the API by itself is a product, not a byproduct of your system, that it wants to be designed. And that it's kind of a side thing, but really, really important, that uh, when you're designing an API, uh, we can imagine you will want to, be, to have clients for this API. And uh, either 
you know how to do caching, and then you can have a lot of them and it's not really expensive, or you don't. And then it's very expensive and doesn't work. And as you know, that you know, caching is one of the three hard things, right? Invalidating caches is a hard thing. And that uh, probably uh, your, you, I mean, your real code, the, 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 the stuff that does things, has really shitty caching semantics. And it has shitty caching semantics, not because you're shitty or your code is shitty. On the contrary, because you're a very good developer. And therefore, you didn't cache everything. You didn't put kind of enormous frontal caches. But uh, when you had a problem, you optimized last. We're supposed to be optimizing last, right? And you put it specifically in the type loop that is called often. And if, and if needed, you added the extraneous uh, call to have this cached. But when you look at your system, it doesn't expose any kind of clear semantics about uh, what is uh, cacheable for how long, how do we handle stale stuff, do we have grace on top of it, and which is one of the reasons that on the implementation level, um, you should probably not bind your RESTful hypermedia API directly to your business classes. You want to have a kind of a bridge, a separation. The only semantics you want to have on the API controller itself are API semantics. So you're, it would be nice, you know, if you have a system that has a nice DSL for doing that. Uh, in Scala, I've seen there's now the nice Scalatra. Uh, we have in the Ruby world uh, Grape and four others. Um, and uh, and decoupling, I, and I know it's kind of weird because it's yet another level of decoupling. Um, but basically, again, you don't want to call, if you have, for example, um, Rails, I don't know, you probably don't want to call your models directly, but something that represents already an, an API level construct. Um, so uh, again, normally, I mean, if all goes well, the uh, file of code representing your API is yay big. Mm, yay yeah, big, maybe. Three screens. Uh, shouldn't be more than that. You probably want to uh, uh, handle the representation of your API in, in separate classes. Because again, this is something that is going to be fluid. There, are, there is bike shedding, right? On the question, should we have underscore, if we're, if we're doing hyper hypermedia, should we have underscore links or links. If I have a list of stuff, should it be an object that has IDs or should it be an array? This is kind of very interesting discussions and probably the dust will settle at a point in time. You don't want to create in your system an enormous amount of inertia that will not allow you to change your mind later. Again, hypermedia is a lot about being future resistant, being able to change my mind, change the content type I'm doing, change my serialization, um, uh, and so simply technically, if you're on an API project, try to decouple those. It's, it's not a huge price to pay, uh, and it will allow you to evolve much uh, faster. By the way, uh, uh, this also makes it much easier to make much smaller APIs. Usually today, we have people doing API dot something, and it's the whole world, right? Um, you might want to consider doing smaller stuff um, and, and kind of having different endpoints, um, different really APIs that are versioned uh, separately. Users can be an API, right? And if you're doing whatever other, I don't, let's do payments. So uh, payments, even if Payments is really coupled in your world to users. Payments cannot exist without users, I don't know. Uh, it's not a problem to have these as really totally different APIs because we kind of know how to couple them back, but uh, with loose coupling, just make you know the link, instead of having user ID, just the href towards the API that does the users. And it allows, again, to... Uh, um, uh, a big part of what we're trying to do is kind of reduce coupling, reduce inertia, so we can live at the rhythm of the web. 
Uh, oh, yeah, by the way, and it's quite amusing, uh, the last data, your root API should serve the directory of services. You've seen that on the Navizia.io thing. So I didn't need to ask guys, where is the new API? What is the deprecated ones? Can I still use this one? Is it broken? Um, uh, again, I believe that a lot of hypermedia is around just communicating to developers and putting the information they need right when they need it. Even if we don't have automatical binding, uh, uh, simply it's nicer. I don't want to go to a different web page to get the implementation. Next one. So this is a, a very bad one. So I call it leaky. And the thing is that designing, I mean, as I've, and I'm kind of going to contradict myself and maybe not. Um, designing an efficient read-write API is something that is going to be very hard. Uh, and it's going to be very hard because uh, writing, well, is hard as we've seen. When we write, usually we don't have caching, so I need to kind of have a system that resists to uh, the billion calls I'm going to have. And more importantly, and we'll see that a bit later at the end, because the client is required to have a deep understanding of the model of the server. And a part of REST, the, the misunderstood part of, of the statelessness of REST is that if it is the client that is initiating these changes in the world, it means that the client needs to understand the world. And we've decided kind of, oh, SOAP is, is, is a bad thing, so, so we don't have a lot of metadata uh, exposed to the client, so probably someone is going to be writing a lot of code. So anyway, it's going to take time, and because usually there is even, if your API is read-write, probably there is more value in the writing side, right? So this is when a user is doing something really important, when he creates something. Reading is nice, but writing is important. Something happened, there's a transaction, money is being created. Um, so, uh, and you know, that uh, reading is also hard, and reading is hard mostly because of aesthetics. Again, because you need to educate a bit your users about your domain model, what this thing does. So we've given them some links which already hmm, give them a sentiment of what is the next step. We've seen that with Navizia.io. This is a transport thing. I have transport networks. I have regions. I have points of interest. I have, okay, this is the domain I'm going to play with. Um, so, uh, but, but again, doing the, if, if you have a rich data, a model and a rich data set and a lot of data, it's, you want at the same time give them all the sugar that is possible, so represent these use cases, the, the immediate ones in the, with the shortest, cleanest URLs uh, you can, uh, but you don't really know how they're, they're going to use that. I mean, you're going to make some assumptions, but if life is really, really good for you, they're going to use it in somewhere, in something that is totally different from whatever you've imagined before. And this is where, uh, when you have an API strategy, probably this is where the very real value for you is created. Because people are creating innovation around your platform, they, they're creating an adherence to your platform, they're probably making you money. Um, so a useful pattern, but a dangerous one, is uh, using composition. So it's like object-oriented composition, the idea is that in, instead of inheriting stuff, and I'm just going to kind of mix together uh, two computer systems. And one of the things I do, and I do often, and kind of works, is take a, a search engine and mix my API, mix, mix the, the signature of my API with theirs. So I often use Elasticsearch. Uh, basically what I do is on top of it, I would uh, uh, add some hypermedia because uh, uh, Elasticsearch isn't, and I want to give information to the user about how you're going to use this. And uh, you basically don't need to document anything because it's just kind of, okay, go to elasticsearch.org. You'll see the documentation there. And um, maybe I can now spend, uh, maybe I'll add some sugar and I have kind of, you know, just shortcuts, so if I have uh, works of art, 
instead of uh, exposing a weirdy Elasticsearch AP, uh, URL, I will just give you a slash artworks. Um, but basically, I'm a superset of the other one. So this is a very, very dangerous thing because this is kind of a leaky abstraction and you're leaking internals, technical internals, stuff that is not from your domain. You haven't taken any decisions, but at the same time, on day one, you have an incredibly rich API. And so this may seem to be in contradiction with the idea of designing the API. Not really, when we're and, and this goes back to Steve's talk. Uh, you do need to design stuff, just don't design everything. There are some conventions you can follow if someone else did that, and it's more or less a rational thing, even if you think it should be underscore links, or link, it's not that important. You're designing a car, probably it's going to have four wheels. Ah. Let's, on this specific car project, not discuss the issue whether six wheels is better or three. Uh, well, let's go for four. So again, this is a dangerous pattern, but can be extremely useful. This one is, is something really, really important. And uh, again, the names are just names. And so we, I call it intentional. And uh, again, the, 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 this is about transactions. And often enough, you will see people try to design RESTful APIs. And they will basically, you know, kind of be RESTful until the moment in which you need to do a transaction. Because how the freaking hell do I do transaction with this weird uh, thing where I can only state transition one resource while it's a whole world I'm going to try to manipulate? And uh, you will see kind of poster boys and people that are supposed to be designing really nice APIs like Stripe. And they'll do a. a um, so, again, a, 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 a kind of a restful thing until they get to cancel a transaction. And then they'll put the verb uh, in the URL, although we've all told them not to, because it's kind of, so how do you cancel? And, 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 and here, I mean, basically the, the whole efficiency of the model is being negated, and the whole future resistance. Uh, uh, and so what happens, I mean, in these semantics with the URL called cancel, what happens if two cancel requests arrive at the same time. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm, I've posted cancel, but I have a slow client, right? So I've started to say cancel. Someone else posted cancel after me, but uh, uh, his transaction succeeded before mine. So the, probably the, the response I'm going to, to get is, okay, canceled, right? But it's not what I thought that happened, it's not my cancellation that happened, it's there. So it's the merchant, so let's imagine that the merchant and the client both can cancel the transaction. We're in a, and we can, you know, we can debug around that, right? We, we, can, we can find solutions uh, to this, but this is a problem that shouldn't exist. We have in, and, and you have even the, in the document in the, that they are giving, you have a status element. Why not post uh, your intent? about why am I canceling this? And uh, basically maybe, I don't know, create a cancellation resource. That's a good thing. And in it say, okay, I cancel it because I'm a client and I want to cancel this transaction, which also makes it, well, asynchronous now, because now I can get this risk. So if, you know, in the fallacies of distributed systems, right? This stuff will break. The network is not always there. Latency is not zero, right? So here, I posted it. Didn't get a response because the network broke. I know how to, you know, my code knows uh, how to continue on. I just get on this resource. So either I'm going to get a 400, 404. 404, got nothing. Or I'm going to get something else, saying, well, this is a stasis currently. And so uh, 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 there is much less breakability here. If both merchant and client post at the same time, or the one at the same time, during the, who cares, right? We'll have two cancellation resources, and we'll have the business logic that says what happens with this resource now. And I, I also get, and this is a financial system, right? I also get 
free logging, I understand why is my system in the state it is, because I have put the intent into the every state transition. So cancellation is great, cancellation requests even probably better, because here I really put the intent into, into the thing. And, uh, and, and, and again, th there's also kind of a weird thing about resources and understanding what a resource is. This is a resource is something that has an address, right? Um, it doesn't need to represent a single entity in the world. It can be anything. The universe can be a resource, the whole world. The fact that there are going to be very complex mechanics. I'm requesting a state transfer, right? The client, this is a, 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 a request response system. Doesn't mean that we have a system to always say yes, on the other hand. So really respecting this side uh, 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 makes uh, um, for much less documentation and breakability. And let's say that uh, we have a change in requirement now saying that a, a transaction is canceled only if all people participating in the transaction are okay for its cancellation. I, I don't even need to change the form of my API here. And it's just because I've, I've respected the ID that we are totally unable to do in a distributed system delete. Delete is not something we know how to do. And basically update, not really so. We can insert a request for an update. This is what we really do. All computer systems only do that because they're only able to write through caches. So nothing as, a, ever gets written immediately. We don't have a synchronous thing. Um, you know, the light of speed problem, nothing happens at the same time. So all we are always submitting are requests for state. So if we materialize it like this, like the reality of computer systems, they break less. Uh, so th there's a rant about deleting. Uh, basically, delete does not have semantics, so there are problems with the model of the HTTP. And so this is the v bad verb. You should probably never use delete, because either, again, you're trying to merge something, invalidate something, uh, but you're never trying to delete, because delete is impossible. Uh, the world is immutable. If something existed at a point in time, it existed, and it's a fact that can no longer be changed. We can say that this fact is bad, it's wrong, that you should be responding with a 404 uh, on this URL, but uh, uh, you probably want to have changed semantics and never delete, so you always insert your deletes. <sighs> Ooh, yeah. Uh, -yah -yah! So uh, this one, again, is a very tricky, dangerous pattern that can be extremely useful. It's what we call content addressable. So content addressable, what it means? It means that the content is by itself the address of a thing. If I know what is the content of a thing, I know where it is. So we have several very, very useful uh, content addressable systems we use currently. You have Git, you have BitTorrent, you have Bitcoin, all of these. Basically, it's a, you have a mathematical function that runs over the content, and from it we know now how to find it, wherever it is. It doesn't need to be on a specific server. The same content can be on different servers, then we have me mechanics uh, in order to do discovery and stuff like that. And, and this is important also because when you look at JSON API, when, uh, although we're kind of saying, okay, this is uh, uh, not the client's job to be constructing URLs, I'm going to give you those, but I'm going to give you a template and you're going to run code that is going to construct these URLs, so they have semantics. If I say comments slash three, comments is a plural, slash three is a singular, and, and we understand that, right? We, we, when we look at the URL, we understand what it means, but it does mean that it's no longer just an identifier. And, uh, and uh, the, the, in the content addressable world, we, we're purely on uh, uh, an identifier, and it's, uh, so it becomes opaque. It, it's going to give you kind of these weirdy URLs, something like that, SHA-1 thingy. Um, it breaks other stuff. URLs are supposed to represent entities, and entities that are stable 
over time. So this is, again, a design issue with uh, the web. The, the, the fact that it doesn't, it integrates time in not a sufficiently fine way. Um, so uh, again, this should be used with parsimony for specific use cases, but we've talked about intentional, right, before. One of the interesting things to do is to reference, when you're modifying something, to reference the thing you are changing. Now, what you would want probably to reference, so you can have uh, revision numbers and stuff like that on the document, but this is, doesn't really work very well in a distributed system because you can not agree. Creating these incremental IDs is not something falsely the whole system can agree upon or will require well, bad, slow stuff. Uh, referencing the content itself, a hash of the document, makes it very clear on which basis of data have you taken your decisions. So uh, for, uh, uh, anyway, documenting the, the kind of the, the previous state of your system, this is something very, very useful. And we even have, you know, kind of the YANA relationships uh, registry. We have all of the relationships that are needed for that, you know, kind of supersedes. This one is the document that changes that one, but we know which one. Think about Git, again, or any kind of uh, source control system. Um, and it's also a very, very amusing way to link to separate systems. Uh, because basically if we say, okay, I reference this object on the other system, and it's going to have a URI, but usually the URI on the other side will want to change over time. So in 10 years from now, uh, it will probably want you know, to be not in the same URL schema. So either we'll need to have some, some kind of very weird, complicated stuff to um, uh, regenerate these URLs, understand it, and maybe the systems will be... If what you're addressing is the content, you can have a kind of the, the, this uh, uh, global resolution service that says, okay, and these are, I remind you, these are good. Okay, these uh, uh, numbers there, are globally unique on the planet. So you can, on the universe, you can resolve them on a universal level. We can go and find uh, where this specific content, specific document is, even 10 or 20 years from now, after we're not doing HTTP anymore. I remind you also that uh, very, very complicated, hard to defend, but REST model, uh, as presented by Phil, does not require HTTP. She's supposed to be working on any kind of transport layer. And this is one of the reasons uh, for which, you know, don't do too much stuff in the headers, because it's about documents. Um, so, and lastly, I remind you that uh, one of the things, when we do hypermedia, uh, one of the questions that I'm often asked is, why the hell is there this self-relationship I'm asking for a URL, and I'm getting back the URL. Uh, you're weird. It doesn't sound useful. Ta-da! Useful. It's the canonical URL. It's, uh, it's very, very useful this way. I can address the same resource in very many different ways. This is normal. So uh, a URL should represent a single resource, an entity, but it doesn't mean that you have a single URL for each entity. Chapter five, curious, curious. So you've, you've already seen that. Basically, another question often asked about uh, hypermedia is, but this is horribly verbose. I don't want to put HTTP, API, in my every document. This will be very heavy and difficult. So uh, you can look again at JSON API, at the other guys. Um, you know, hyperlinks work very, very well with relative URLs. So if you do just href equals one, that works. You have a base URL. And again, if you put in self, mm, we can say, okay, just comes after self. So we don't have clear semantics on that. And we don't have clear semantics on using the URL segment, fragment part, the, the thing after the, the diez. Uh, but that's really not a problem. So we've had the discussion earlier, the, oh, you've put IDs in your 
uh, document this is a bad thing because it's not in URI? And my answer was, yes, it is. Look at the web, HTML. We have IDs, and we have a way to reference those using the other thing. It's a simply, I mean, kind of copy the pattern, and basically your document without changing it much is a hypermedia document. It's simply, if you say just, hey guys, I'm not inventing anything, when I say ID, it's not a local, opaque identifier that we don't know. It's my URL, Diaz ID. And it will always go and represent this entity there. Um, so, uh, uh, the problem basically currently around that is that there is this debate. So there's Siren, there is HAL, there are a lot of people that are proposing different formats of serialization. Uh, the way in which you're supposed to represent precisely that, and my theory is that it's not important. Again, we're not trying to recreate SOAP. We're not trying to recreate enormous, automagical, mechanical beasts that are able to do everything and it, everything Java works with .NET, and I've never seen that work. It doesn't work. It always broke. We've put a lot of metadata, never enough. The last moment, someone had to code stuff, and then everything was broken. It's complicated. You know? So uh, again, for me, it's not a problem that we will be writing code as long as we can write not a lot of code as long as we can follow some conventions, and as long as we kind of know how do we get from V0 to, v to V1. Uh, how do... Uh, so, uh, um, uh, again, the dust has not settled here, and so for people are saying, okay, I'm going to wait for the standard to be there. It's just not useful, you don't need to. It will work quite well if you don't, as long, again, because uh, there is no enormous technical stack, client-side technical stack in front of you. Just, you're, you're kind of, you're being nice to developers and, and, and you're, you're creating something predictable and useful. Next, I have no idea what time it is. Oh, oh, this is very late. Okay, so lazy versioning, just, uh, so, uh, uh, two last, Quick patterns, lazy versioning. Lazy versioning is again something that you're, you, 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 I think you're gonna love. It's a very, it's a very strong thing. Basically, it means so for all the guys putting V1s in the the URLs, uh, uh, probably you want to put these version numbers inside the documents and not in the URLs. So it might sometimes be useful as long as you're doing the thing I said before, on slash on the API route, give links to the different. Uh, but of, on, on a large-scale distributed system, and we're all building a large-scale distributed system where the documents you are generating might live a very long time in other systems, right? They're having a copy of those, and putting the version number of the API inside the document allows the client, as it allows the server, to make rational decisions about how do I handle old stuff, Maybe I have a migration for it, so I know that I've changed this field to something else, and I can totally, the, the, the end point um, uh, uh, I have is totally capable of handling uh, an older version document, it doesn't break, or I will say, no, sorry guy, okay, expectation failed, or 412, or whatever, this is not, not a good document, but uh, uh, it's very, very hard again, to, to, to handle the versioning thing on a distributed thing, thing where you want to say to the client, there is a chance, it doesn't mean that it will never break, but there is a chance I will be able to gracefully upgrade my system during a transaction. It's kind of a, a cool thing. Basically here, you have two versioning requirements. One is versioning the document itself. Again, the SHA-1 or, or you know, a content signature of this representing the previous state is a good thing, uh, uh, but uh, so this is the rev thing, the, the document revision, and you probably want to have the, the version of the API. Uh, up, 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 up. So last one, 
It's the magic, magic part of uh, Roy Fielding's dissertation. Again, this is back to the fact that state transitions are initiated by the client, which basically means the client understands what the hell the server is doing. And we all understand that this breaks, this does not work, right? We cannot have on the client, we are not going to re-implement the domain knowledge we have on the server on the client. Oh, what, what, I mean, what have we done here? It's horrible. So we just used the uh, HTTP layer as a transport, but I'm, so there is the magic -y solution. Let's send code that represents the model. And so it will be probably JavaScript, right? And we will be executing third party code on our servers. Uh, that really sounds like fun. Uh, so this is basically two things here, a warning. Uh, this whole model of RESTful hypermedia stuff works for s some stuff. And the idea again is if we can do 80% eight, of the easy stuff uh, with that, it's just an architectural style, it's a guideline, right? Maybe there are 20% where we're going to get out of the model and try to find an efficient way to do it. It's not precisely that because, again, sending JavaScript code over the wire, eh, I don't know, except one use, use case which is uh, you don't want to have probably api.example.org. www.example.org is a very nice route for your API. And it's about content type negotiation. So basically, if I visit it with a browser, I get an HTML page with code on demand, with JavaScript, and have my application. And if I'm asking the content type JSON, or XML, I get the document representation of the thing. It's just a representation thing. So this might not be your public website, but your admin, your backend, probably doesn't need to be anything but your API. It's just, just you know, a bit of Ember.js, and it's the same URL. So I'm browser asking document slash entry point to URL, maybe entry point to authentication. That would be normal, right? Refresh page, browser asks through Ajax, the same address, gets the JSON representation, maybe, so if it's a, the, the, the entry point is, I don't know, accounts, I will get a list of accounts, the pagina pagination for uh, uh, accounts. Um, again, here, uh, uh, the, the main message is, HTML is a good uh, hypermedia format, which should have been self-evident. Thank you, guys. One question. One question or two. Who wants to take the opportunity to ask a question to an expert? Hi. I would like to know, according to you, if uh, the version could be better uh, uh, present inside the header of uh, the after the response call of the API. Uh, because you know the version is not very um, inside the resource that is serialized uh, in JSON, for instance. You have it in the slides. There are very specific mechanics you want to be putting in. Basically, you are going to write client libraries. If you're doing an API, you are going probably to be the guys writing the client libraries. So you have a kind of a bit of control over what happens there. And you should tell anyway people uh, uh, writing client libraries how they're supposed to be testing for the version incompatibility thing. So basically it's a kind of, okay, uh, you should version your client, should have the same version number as the major version of your API. So if I have an API v1, uh, then we're going to have you know, kind of the minor issues and stuff, and it's, it's kind of RFC style. So if you're on a different minor version, you should probably put a warning in your application log. Hey, I'm talking with an API that is in a different minor version, so this is probably going to work. Expect some breakability. And maybe do an exception when you see documents starting to come your way, 
that are um, uh, of a different major version. But again, you can decide how you're going to handle that. The, the, the nice thing about this, this pattern is that maybe so I, I will just save them locally until I can handle them. Because if I know that there is a version uh, 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 that is higher, I can my, maybe just you know, kind of uh, 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 update my library and, ooh, and I haven't lost a single transaction. That answers? Reader? Is header. Header. Oh. Again, yeah, theoretically, you should have put it in the header, but uh, no. Because again, uh, uh, depending on too much magic stuff on the headers makes for uh, people writing code for you less happy. Uh, so it's not a biggie, but probably, yeah, it's simply simpler to put it, it there. And again, uh, and you're uh, writing a deep dependency on HTTP, and we want REST to be kind of better than that, so it should w work on XMPP2 and stuff. So it, it's nice if you know, can, can you get a document and ooh, works whatever transport it came my way. Anything else? Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thanks.